For those of you, I think everybody knows Trent, award winning world traveler. <laughs> okay, we're going to start off with that. Right? <laughs> okay. okay, my concept of when we first started talking about this was I thought it would be useful to broaden it a little bit wider than just turning a bowl so that you could carve feet on it or turn the make a bowl with handles. So I will talk about those, but beyond that, this concept of leaving something on your turning and then carving it off lends itself to a whole range of things. For example, these salt and pepper shakers. Does that work out just holding like yep. that? Um, I left a no. ring of wood all the way around as I was turning this and then I went to my computer and printed out the word and put it, stuck it on with uh, uh, glue and then started carving with Dremel tool and hand tools and then sandpaper to try and make it look like there was never a ring there and that you kind of somehow stuck the letters on. The more successful you are at disguising the original uh, band, the more successful the piece is in for what I like to do. So that's just one example of what you could do if you wanted to leave a band for do making something. The other thing that I've seen done is leave bands all the way around and then make vertical cuts so that you end up with little uh, kind of water drops, you know, coming out from the surface of that. Mike does that uh, on some of his uh, madrone burl work, and so then it just all twists. If it's all wet when he does that, then it twists and dries and warps, and it's really quite interesting uh, what you can do with that. So that same concept then would work for these. Most of these pieces here are. Uh, more or less unfinished uh, or works uh, in progress that I have done various things on to see for practice. This one you can see had a very, very small, can you, does that show up? Not. A very small ring and so then I cut away and just left those three tiny feet. You have to make sure that the bottom is still you know, underneath so when you set it down it touches on the feet rather than there. But the better you can get your eye to follow along and make a, a curve that looks like feet were stuck on afterward, again, the more successful visually I think the piece will be. This piece had some very bad cracks in here and it was about oh, it's maybe 10 years ago or more when we were redoing our bathroom we had an old clawfoot tub in there and it kind of reminded me of, uh, of that. So I uh, basically cut the one side out where the big crack in the hole was and then just did the same on the other side and then made three uh, feet. So these are like, uh, you know, like a shoe or something. So you can do anything you want, you know, on the, on the bottom. Can, does that show up okay? Yeah. yeah. And then the rest was just uh, hand carved and, and again, I wasn't really happy with, I was happy with how this worked, but not with these uh, things, so I've, I've never really done anything more with that. This one was a very early one that I did. Uh, I entered it in Dimensions back in 1992 or something like that, and it wasn't accepted. And uh, there's some obvious reasons that I understand more now that I've learned more about it. Uh, but it was a really fun, intriguing way to go. This was one of my very early ones about leaving a ring on and then carving away. So where these six legs are was a ring that was around the whole thing and then carved away to leave this vertical, uh, not, well, kind of a, an angled plane. And then these were cut out of plywood and then carved and glued, with, glued in with a dowel. And then this, uh, I broke this off just in the car coming here tonight because I wasn't being very careful. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's uh, glued on like this. So this is a little fishing rod. My brother-in-law is real fine, uh, loves fly fishing. So the idea was, what did I call this? I think it was uh, um, 
Insectivora versus Pisces, I think, <laughs> something like that. So this is an insect uh, with, you know, kind of wings and uh, color, and then the fishing rod with the, the insect going fishing. But you're gonna, you get the sense of what I'm talking about with how you can uh, leave a ring on and then carve it away. The one that I've done probably the most of is uh, the Cowboy series. I call them just another bull. Um, and I used to work with a lot of dairy cattle um, when I was much younger. And so I had lots of visions of various you know, mastitis and cows with supernumerary teeth and all the trouble you see when you're a veterinarian. And so some of these I, I used to make them with maybe another little teeth in here and then I have people say, don't you know cows don't have five teeth? And I say, well, some of them do. <laughs> so anyway, that's, that's again a ring that's just left around here. Inside here is the foot where I've grasped it with the chuck. Then that's all turned away and then I'm left with this ring and I cut away, uh, then texture it and, uh, and color it after that. Three. Well, yeah. the, the part that's a little bit harder is just making sure it, it uh, sits, particularly if you're using green wood and it's, it's moving on you. So sometimes I will leave these a little bit long and not worry too much about whether it uh, balances until it's completely dry. Then you can take it and go on sandpaper like this and kind of, you know, freshen it up. I have also turned them where I've just touched with three. So maybe, you know, kind of sneak a little bit here, a little bit here, and leave the fourth one a little bit closer by itself, but not have it touching. So it still balances more on three legs, or sorry, three, three teats in this case. So if you were going to make a bowl with handles, in many ways, it's the same thing. So this is a blank, I forget when I turned it, doesn't really matter. Um, but you can probably see that this is the end grain from here to here, and that has not uh, changed much in diameter, right? Because uh, the end grain doesn't really move. But in here, it's squeezed in. So I've left this thick enough that I could then put it like this, turn a foot on here, turn around, put it in a chuck, and then turn the whole thing back round again. Certainly nothing wrong with it. That's a, one way you can do it. The other way you can do it is to not waste some of this length and then use these as handles. Okay, well, what do you mean? How does that work? So this was one that had that same thing. It was long here and then it had narrowed up here. So I've turned this, I've still got the foot on here, and I've come up like that underneath. And then I've taken it to the bandsaw. I put it up like this on the bandsaw. Put the table of the bandsaw on what I think is going to be a fairly appropriate angle for cutting this off. And then I go through and then remove this piece. Then do the same on the other side. So now do you recognize it? So it's a bowl with handles. Now I have all this to finish by hand. I have this to finish by hand, but the basic shape that I want is, is there. And so the rest of it's done by hand. I don't, I don't know how you do the rest of it on the lathe. The only other part that's on the lathe is putting this onto uh, a jam chuck or a vacuum chuck and turning, turning the, the foot off. So that's, that's a really fun project to start out with, to do something where you're going to leave some of the wood on and then remove the wood that, you're, uh, that you're, you don't want there. So doing it by hand, do you mean like for sanding, or do you want that ledge gone? I want to make sure when I'm all done that this curve is reflected in the curve that comes over. I want to be 
careful that I make a decision about that and that as I'm sanding, I don't just get one rounded, uh, kind of a, a blurred mess. So in here, I don't know for sure until I start doing that, but I think I would probably leave this little lip here and then finish this and then you can see that it's not exactly equal all the way along. And so I would put a marker on the inside and then run a pencil around like that so that I can visually see how far I have to take this down so that it's even all the way around. And then the same, same on that side. But some of that depends on how, how it goes as I start to do the handwork. A lot of this can be done with a, um, I use a pneumatic sanding disc mounted between centers on the lathe, and then just hold this by hand. Or you could, uh, if you have one of those uh, spindle sanders, you could put that at an angle, you know, kind of. The problem with doing it upside down is a little harder to, to gauge how uh, even you are in the edge around here. So that is one way to make use of the extra width or extra length that's on the end grain versus the part that's gone on there. So you would turn a foot on this and then as you came up here, you would leave this whole thing. And so as you turn this part here, which is this part here, you will have, you, you want to get down to where there's wood because you want to touch both of those. But there won't be any wood necessarily in here because of this being a narrower dimension than this in the first place. In wood that really goes, you know, a, the, there's a huge difference in the amount of shrinkage between here and here. You even get a more pronounced effect. And that's one of the things that I think it was Ralph Reed. Some of you will know Ralph Reed from the Wood Guild. He was the one that I heard about this first, uh, doing that. And I thought, that's a really good idea. And so, um, and I don't suppose Ralph probably came up with it, you know, as the first Any questions about that? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. See some noggings? Is <laughs> that yeah, because you're going to sleep or because you're agreeing? <laughs> this one was, um, Mike uh, had a show for one of the Emmas called A Show About Nothing. Was So you could do anything you wanted that uh, had using that as the theme, kind of like the green, the green yeah. thing. So I had at one point, uh, I can't remember how the heck I got thinking about binary numbers and what the binary code was for each letter of the alphabet. Because each, you know, on a computer, each one is zeros and ones, that's all there is. It's either there's electricity is on or it's off, and that's how everything is done. And so I found the, not the zeros and ones for N-O-T-H-I-N-G. So if you knew where to start, and you could read binary code, this says nothing, okay? And then uh, I carved the three feet on there, basically the same idea, leave a ring, the little uh, part that I would have held that the foot would have been in there, and then I've carved those away and made these feet. At one point, um, I was burning these uh, circles in here, and I didn't realize that this had been a little bit thinner in there, it went right through with the burn. So then I had to put a little uh, rivet in there to uh, to cover that up. But you won't know that, would you? <laughs> I thought it was on purpose. Yeah, well, uh, a lot of stuff may look like it's on purpose. So I'm going to talk a little bit now and, and do some turning. Um, my assistant in my shop forgot to put the uh, three-point drive in. <laughs> I don't like to blame myself for these things. Uh, it's a poor carpenter that blames his tools, but I did forget to bring the three-point drive, so all I've got is this um, uh, safe drive, which works fine for smaller stuff, but it might slow the process down a little bit for what we're doing. So this is a piece of uh, birch that's got some spalting in it. Uh, we're just going to imagine uh, kind of a bar shape and then we're going to leave a reasonable amount on this end that we're going to uh, make a foot on. Okay, so that's that's the process. So there'll be a bit of noise from this lathe that normally isn't there because I've got a lot of pressure uh, trying to get enough friction on this so it might drown me out a little bit. If you 
can't hear, you can't see, uh, get my attention somehow, throw something at me. Well, maybe not a tool, but uh, uh, get my attention. I'm gonna try not Deb was going to be here tonight, but I thought, in just on the chance that she is, I better make sure I use a dovetail jaw on my chops. <laughs> use a caliper, you know, to measure that rather than having to take it off, but I didn't bring one, so that's why I'm doing that. I don't know if any of you know, notice this, you might not be able to find it on the, on the camera, but a good way to tell if, if you're cranking on this and it just doesn't seem to be getting any tighter, if you put some sawdust right by the tailstock, then if it's loose, as I start cranking this back, I can actually see a gap where the where the sawdust was. Just a, a handy little trick. vertical surface here so that when the jaws of the chuck on this part Oops, sorry. Okay. Yeah, um, on this part of the chuck to engage on the wood I don't want this part of the to be down along here so I've got to make sure that that dovetail is appropriately sized and then it's got a nice flat spot there to give it extra stability as I'm turning so it doesn't flip out quite as easily. Okay, now what am I doing? I want to make, uh, so we're going to make some feet down here. We've got a, the cut that I'm using here is basically a scraping cut. I'm careful when I put this when I engage this with the wood, I don't want this edge right here to go into the wood. I want to start by turning it past the point. So this is not a bevel rubbing cut. If I was to try and rub the bevel here, I'd end up with a big mess because I've got way too much wood in contact with the, or too much of this metal in contact, and it would just grab and twist. If I want to rub the bevel, I need to turn my tool around this way and then I would put that part again against it, and then as I bring the tool this way, it would engage. Let's see if we can just show that on that. Can you see down here? Okay, so I'm rubbing the bevel. I get myself in position so that I've got the handle against my body. I bend my knees down, and then as I bring this up, that point will start going up. This is going to be the transition. These are going to be feet, the feet back here. And then this is going to be where, uh, but the vessel is going to go under the feet and come back out. Kind of, well, not so much like this one. More like the, like the inset, not, as it, it, uh, not quite as exaggerated. So we need a bit more. Like 
cuts cut, if I move my <laughs> whole body, I get a way more control than if I try and push with my arms. tells me it's a really good idea <laughs> to uh, tighten up these set screws on your lathe before you... Uh... Would Leo the lathe be doing? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if this is going to work. From past experience I found that when I put this... What's he going to say? If I finish this finely refined, get everything just exactly like I want without any run out, then I move it to the chuck, I often have a variation. And so then I have to start all over again. So rather than doing a lot of fine finesse work here, I'm just going to uh, put it into the, into the chuck now. And Any, any of you? Make my truck better than your well, no. I bought this one at the last conference from Ken because I wanted to have one with smaller jaws. And the uh, one-way uh, talon chuck doesn't go quite as, as small for making little boxes. It's a really nice chuck. Plus, it has the indexing holes on it if you wanted to use those if you didn't have an indexer on your on your lathe. Any of you mechanical engineers know, does it make a difference if, you, if I use both of these to tighten? Just in your mind, Trent. Somebody asked me that at the class that I was doing on Saturday, and I said, well, I figured they'd probably put two holes in it for a reason. <laughs> Yeah, you get the one hole. I don't really know. My feeling is that it does uh, even out the pressure on those, um, those jaws, but I don't know whether. Well, it you know, seems you can get one tight, and then you. If you if then you move it, then it tightens hole, more. It yeah. tightens more in the second hole, so I don't know. This one I wouldn't. Think, like, I don't think it matters at all. Yeah. It's just that it gives the wood a little bit of time to. Maybe. To set, so you th think you're gaining a little bit, but if you just sat at that same hole and then maybe the other thing I know works is the Bakke solution, where you put this in here and then you have a bar out yeah. here, <laughs> yeah. put it on the handle. <laughs> oh, he's not even here. We shouldn't make fun of him. Okay, you can see that run out there. So there, well, maybe you can't, but there is a there is a bit of a of a run out there. There'll be a lot more when I get my first cut from the inside. Yeah, to give them a, just a little bit more stability because if it's too tall and the feet just get smaller, it's really wiggly wobbly. Yeah. Uh, just because of what you were doing, I think yeah. they had to be. Yeah. The other thing I found is that, how can I explain this properly? Often when I'm doing, doing the cow bowls, as an example, visually it seems like I. I've gone in too far and it's going to be too small. But when I get it all finished, it works better if I leave this just a little bit bigger than I think I should. And that's why I left this a little bit bigger than maybe visually it looks. But when you get all the other wood away, it loses some of that mass. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. But, but just because of the angle, I figured you had, they had to be coming Splaying out. Splaying out, yeah. 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 Um, there's one little spot right in here 
where there's all a little bit of a flat spot. So we're just going to get rid of that. Um, this is where I might sometimes use a um, use a uh, shear scraper. So this is the Elio. So I'll just leave it right down here. The Elio uh, scraper. It's um, fashioned after the uh, uh, what's his name from Israel, Eli, Eli, Eli Abacera. So it's Eli and Elio. Always oh, a good idea if you can manage it to look behind rather than looking at your tool, and you get a better chance of seeing the shape that you're getting. What I'm aiming for is a, a continuously changing radius that has no flat spots in it. I'm also trying to avoid having a big mark induced knuckle problem, which I keep touching that chuck and I go, whoa, 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 okay, I better pay attention. Lee Valley has an elastic band that goes around. Oh, yeah, 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 they do. Yep. I have one. Yeah, it uh, sits on my shelf. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I look at it every once in a while, oh, yeah, I bought that for that, didn't I? So your knuckles never touch it? <laughs> yeah, that's my, my neck, old knuckles, I've never touched that piece that's of fabric. <laughs> The other thing I did find is when I'm turning and there, it's going quite fast, it just loosens up. It's got enough centrifugal force that it, just, it doesn't stay on the, on the thing. Maybe the elastic's gone. Um, one of the things that I will often do to try and decide whether I've got the look I want is to put a flat, a straight edge along here and go down, rock it back and forth. And if it stops at any point, I, okay, I know for sure there's a bad spot there. So it's just a kind of a visual, a visual uh, cue to help you decide if you've got. And for, for now, that's that's all we're going to do. Okay. So at this point, then, I've got. I'm happy with what what's gone on here. The rest of it will all change as we uh, finish. Uh, so I don't know how this is going to work. I'm going to have to. Uh, I want to just show you a little bit about how I hollow it out. I'm not going to do the whole thing uh, tonight, but we'll talk a little bit about, about the hollow, because it's just going to be an open box. It's not going to be hollow. Turn. But I'm going to have to... Do you want me to move? Well, let me just see. I'll just show you what I'm going to do, Gary, and then we'll decide. We'll have to do something because I can I back up. The... Um, Uh, enough length here. This chuck has doesn't go on, doesn't thread all the way on, so that it's against the shoulder. So there's more vibration than is really going to be practical. But I'll just show you the essence of what I do. Is I start out here, rubbing the bevel, then just turn this up a little bit and make my cut. I'm going to have to do very light cuts here. Just to Another solution for it, but we'll just—you can see how it's already gone out of out of out of round because, of, and I don't think it's a looseness of it. So what happened there was I got a tip because as I was coming back here, I didn't have my tool uh, in an upright position, so it should have been like that. So as soon as it touched, it went across like that, okay? And you can avoid that. Let's get rid of my... By going in here and then turning it up and down, and it'll just tickle it a little bit like that. Now as I turn it, I've got, oh, 64 <coughs> an inch, half a millimeter. That the tip of that tool can rest in, and then it doesn't. Now, it, now it's got enough stability that it won't slip back. That's 
probably all I'm going to be able to do on, on this one uh, because of that, the trouble with this. I didn't realize that this chuck wouldn't work on, uh, on, on here, but I will show you. It just doesn't touch to the shoulder? I think that's the problem, yeah. You need a washer. <coughs> yeah, it needs a washer in between. So this part here isn't tightening up against here. And so it's, it's vibrating. I don't think the wood has moved in the chuck as much as the chuck just it doesn't go back in the same position. However, we have a solution. <laughs> <laughs> Due to the magic of television, we now have a somewhat similar piece of wood. So um, as I'm, I have turned the foot off on this one, but you can see that basically we're, you know, we, we've done something very, very similar to that. The, the thing that I have been conscious of when it was like this, and I still had a foot, right, and I'm turning it, and I'm doing exactly what we were doing on that one. As I'm coming down here, I want to be paying attention to how deep I go, because I've made a decision in my head that I want the bottom of the bowl to be below where the feet come off. So if I put this on here now, okay, then you can see where the inside bottom of the bowl would be. And that tells me that I've got to go a little bit further in here with my uh, with my carbon. And I'll just show you what I did after I finished that inside. So you finish this inside, you sand it, you do everything that you want to do while it's still got a foot on this end. Yeah, well, I could probably use the other chuck, but for this one, there. Yeah. So then you make a jam chuck, or in this case, I've got a, uh, an aluminum with a rubber uh, vacuum, uh, vacuum chuck that will uh, give me what I need. So then this, this would go on here, and your tail sock would come back into here. And that's why I really like those one-way tail stocks, where I've got a ring as well as a center. I've used the ones where you have quite a big cone, and it just comes down to a cone. I find those don't reseat as accurately as the one, the one way, like the one way that has that cut ring. You know what I'm talking about? The safe drive. No. It's like the safe drive right here. Okay, so the live center has a point and then it has this uh, knife, I'll call it a knife edge, just before the threads. And that gives me a way better uh, centering when I put it back on this way than the ones that just have a cone. I just, that's just my own personal preference. So imagine now, I'll turn it this way. So you're seeing this, okay? And so what, before I start removing all this and get rid of the uh, tail star of the, uh, I would take <clears throat> and I'd look at my indexing mechanism and I'd just say, okay, how many legs do I want? Well, in this case, I have three. So I would get my pencil and I would set it so when it's on the tool rest, my pencil is at center, okay? Now you can't even put a, if you do this a lot, you can make a little ring in here or put a mark or something on there so you know where it is. Then you bring it here, you set your marker, and then you make a mark, okay? Then you make the next mark, and then you do your third one. And when you're all done, you have a mark that never ever leaves the turning until you're completely finished your carving. It gives you your reference point, because it's so easy to kind of forget where the heck was I. Um, 
you know, or the line is gone and you have to you know, try and redraw it and then you have to put it back in and try and find it again. So I just try and never leave that. I'll put other lines around saying, okay, that's kind of what I, what I want my foot to look like. And you could even do a template on a piece of paper. It's good, then you can you'll get the same uh, look, on, the same shape for each of your feet. Then the rest of it is uh, done by hand. So for this part in here, I used uh, a little Japanese saw, you know, and cut like that, cut like that. So the quickest way to get rid of wood is with a saw if you can cut a, a, a you know a decent sized chunk, and so you're, you're not worried about anything except not cutting into the area that you want to finish, and so you cut that out. Then I the rest of this was done with a, a little like a jackknife, basically a carving knife, and then once those are done, and I do this in between centers just like this, I find that it's my best vice, um, and you can lock this. 